topic of today's video is the Third Millennium Bible. It's a new authorized version of the Holy Bible. The complete authorized version of 1611 updated. Complete means that it does include the Apocrypha. Update is a, a term that means that it's been revised in a way to modernize it. To give you a sense for the size, I'll bring over two Bibles with similar contents. Here is the Knox version, which, like this Third Millennium Bible, has a single column format. The Knox designers opted for a wider text column, so it's a little bit wider and not as tall, because the Third Millennium Bible designers have included more lines of text. I think the font here is a bit larger as well. Here is a Bible with very similar contents. It's uh, Cambridge's Cameo, King James Version Bible with the Apocrypha. A much shorter book, not as wide, not as thick. It has a smaller font. The Cameo also has a two-column format and verse-by-verse -verse arrangement, whereas this is in paragraphs. So let's, let's talk about the dimensions. This book is nine and a quarter inches tall, five and five eight eighths inch is wide, and 1.9 inches thick. As I've mentioned, the text is in a single column in a paragraph format. The column is 99 millimeters wide. I count about 66 characters per line and about 53 lines per page. This has a little bit fewer than 53 because it also has notes at the bottom of the page. The page dimensions are 228 millimeters tall, that's 9 inches tall, and 133 millimeters wide, that's 5.2 inches wide. The margins are at the top of the page from this line to the edge, 12 to 15 millimeters. The inner margin can be as much as 16 millimeters, particularly at the beginning of Genesis. It's less than that here. The outer margin from the edge of the text to the edge of the page ranges from 15 to 20 millimeters. And at the bottom of the page, from the bottom of a descender on the references to the edge of the page, is between 10 and 15 millimeters. Remember there are 25.4 millimeters in an inch. I characterize the print as dark and sharp, but not particularly bold, and there is some print non-uniformity. I characterize the print non-uniformity as common and moderate, and this gives you a sense for how it ranges. You have a fairly dark page, page 539 in the Old Testament on the right, and a relatively light page, page 481 in the Old Testament on the left. I mention Old Testament here because the pages in this volume are numbered separately, the Old Testament, the Apocrypha, and the New Testament section. So let's say a few words about font size in the text. Capital letters are comparable to Times New Roman 9 point. Lowercase, to my eye, are closer to 10 points. Line height, that is, Distance from baseline to baseline is 3.71 millimeters. That is 10.5 points. You should be able to see here that the text is not line matched. You can see letters printed on the opposite side of the page are offset from the letters that are printed on this side. So looking at the New Testament now, this is Luke chapter 17. You will notice that pronouns for deity are capitalized. The words of Christ are not in red ink, they're in black. They're in a black oblique font that looks to be a little bit bolder than the normal font. Another thing that you will notice is since this oblique font is used for the words of Christ, translator supplied language, that is language that doesn't map to anything in the source language, is not in italic font. As far as I've been able to tell, all the books of the Bible do begin on a fresh page. There's Second Peter, First John, Second John. You see, there's even a blank sheet here at the end of First John to accommodate the desire to begin each book on a fresh page. There are references at the bottom of the page. They are in a roughly seven to seven and a half point font. 
but you will not see the normal King James Version text and translation notes there. Book titles as well as page contents are at the outside top of the page and page numbers are at the center top. There are relatively bold verse numbers within the paragraphs. They are not hard to find. The chapters are divided with the chapter number in bold between them. There are no headings in the text, but you do have the old style chapter summaries, and those are printed in about a seven to seven and a half point font. Poetic sections of the scriptures, such as the Psalms, are printed accordingly. Let's talk a bit about the paper. I measure the sheet thickness at 39.2 micrometers, which allows me to estimate the paper weight to be 36 GSM. The paper is very nearly matte. There isn't much of a sheen, so that doesn't cause much of an issue. In terms of color, it's a very light cream. It's very close to being white. There is show through, and it can be distracting. When, because the text is not line match, you do get the effect where you see sort of a uh, confused background image on certain pages. The paper, though, is relatively opaque. Words can be read on the following page, but it isn't very bad at all. I think you should be able to make out some language there from the very next book. So Jerusalem is right in here. I think you should be able to read that. As one comes to the end of the apocalypse, there are two blank pages for taking notes, and a, well, another blank page afterwards, and then a relatively heavy page used as a liner. So this is a normal hardback paste-off type construction. There are red and yellow head and tail bands. I think you should be able to see that there. It's mostly yellow. There are no ribbon markers. It is a burgundy hardback. I've taken the cover off so that you can see that. It's rather a slick material. It doesn't cloth overboard. And it tells you the publisher's information, third millennium publications. And the back is fairly clean. It's a sewn binding and lies open in Genesis. The stitching is visible between 3rd John and Jude. Let's see if I can get there quickly. And perhaps you'll be able to see that down there in the gutter. But there are lines of stitching down there. You have to pull the paper apart fairly far to be able to see them. There's definitely one right there near my thumb. Of course, the signatures are very well defined here at the edge of the text block and then along the edge of the pages you can see how they layer. There are no maps, there is no concordance, and as you can see this Bible does lie open in Genesis and here at the beginning it's relatively flat. The text does drop away into the gutter so as you get farther in you have this phenomenon if you're reading this page then this one curves quite a bit so to read this page you need to adjust the the text block and uh, the same thing happens farther in so um, it's certainly readable but the inner margin is not so wide that you can just leave it and read it without adjusting the text block so coming into the volume from the front you see a half leaf with a guarantee, title page itself, publisher's uh, name, Gary, South Dakota in the United States. It does, I should mention again, contain the Apocrypha Deuterocanonical books. This is the King James set. The uh, copyright page, this gives you the ISPN here. It is called the New Authorized Version. And uh, this is the first printing my copy is from Dickinson Press in Grand Rapids, Michigan. The table of contents, and you will notice that the page numbers 
um, go back to one at the beginning of each section, as I've mentioned. So you have the 66 books of the Protestant canon, and plus these books and sections that um, are called apocryphal or deuterocanonical. I've uh, built a chart just to show you the difference between the King James Version Apocrypha, which you see here, the apocryphal books and sections that are in the Douay Reims, and the apocryphal books that you will find in an ecumenical Bible like the New Oxford Annotated Bible. Clearly the New Oxford Annotated Bible has more. The King James Version has more material than is normally included in the Douay Reims. Next we see the books of the Bible in alphabetical order, followed by abbreviations. Explanation of features and format. Uh, they have made no textual omissions. No scripture passages have been omitted. It uh, updates obsolete words. We'll look at a few of those. I will mention that on the back of the dust jacket, it gives examples of word updatings. So they've gotten rid of Asade, Kind, Moraine, Whist, and Sith, all of which I'm fond of, by the way. Um, and they've uh, changed some words that have, uh, they've replaced some words that have changed in meaning, like prevent, conversation, and carriage. Again, I like the older ones better. And they haven't changed some words, so they leave covetousness alone, mercy, judgment, blessed, made whole, and holy ghost. Let's uh, another look at the dust jacket. This is what they say on the back. So here's a paragraph summary, and this is special features and format, and you can freeze that if you like. And there is the ISBN again. Okay, and so general wording words used in the text of the Third Millennium Bible are in general current usage and found in the best modern dictionaries. They've standardized spelling. They have made some punctuation changes. We'll look at some of those. Words of Christ, as we've seen, are printed, they call it italic, I call it oblique. The A is different in italic, and all they've done is turn the letters, and so I think that's better called oblique. Chapter summaries uh, from the 1611 are included, although they've been updated. There are postscripts that are in the authorized version, and they've retained them. They've used poetic format, as we've seen. Brackets are used to enclose English translations of some Hebrew proper nouns in the Old Testament. They are not part of the biblical text, but are taken from the explanatory notes found in the original 1611 King James. They've capitalized references to God, uh, the names of uh, God, Lord, God, and Jehovah have been retained exactly as they appear in the King James Version, cross-references. Um, which appeared in the marginal notes, have been included at the bottom of the page. Additional gospel parallel cross-references are also included. Standard English in reference to gender, so they haven't used modern gender-neutral language. They have an uncrowded text. I think that's generally right. Page size, the distinctive shape, assures a book which, while printed in a readable type style, is not overly bulky. And what they've done is... Uh, They've had a single column in order to keep the column from being too wide. They've actually made the book relatively tall. That keeps it from being too thick. The updater is to the readers. So we have an essay here. Uh, this paragraph is somewhat interesting. To enhance the verbal appeal of the text, the updaters have arranged poetic portions in prosodic format and in a manner that they may be read responsively. Other features include a clear readable typeface, single column format, modern punctuation and paragraphing. All the chapter summaries are included. The words of Christ are printed in the larger italic type style for emphasis. Personal pronouns referring to God have been capitalized to give due reference to the Godhead and to promote understanding. I think a lot of us are somewhat ambivalent, and perhaps some of us are negative about that because it makes what is ambiguous in the source, uh, makes a decision about it. So here we take another close-up look at the font. 
a relatively attractive, um, nice line spacing, relatively dark, so I think it's, uh, it's decent. And now on the left, you see the smaller font in the Cambridge Cameo. Smaller, but much darker as well. On the left now, this is the font in the Baronius Press Knox edition. On the left now is the font in the Revised Standard Version New Oxford Annotated Bible. And here on the left is the font in the Ignatius Press Revised Standard Version 2nd Catholic Edition on its much yellower paper. So I'd like to look at a few passages now to give you a sense for how different and how similar this is to the original King James Version. First we'll look at 2 Corinthians 6, 11 through 13. And if you compare it side by side with the King James Version, as I've done on this chart, the original King James on the left, the new authorized version on the right, you see that we have opened instead of open. There's an insertion of an and before our heart is enlarged. Bowels has been replaced by affections. And for a recompense in the same, in the original King James Version, we now see as a recompense for this. Next, let's take a look at Galatians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. You'll see that affect has been replaced by seek after, not well by for no good, affect by seek after again, affected by sought after. In Ezekiel 1, 16 through 18, you see a number of changes. You see the Americanization of the spelling of color. Um, punctuation changes, you see a comma replacing a colon, and a semicolon replacing a colon. All four had the same likeness, replaces they four had one likeness. Other punctuation changes, and then rims replaces rings in a couple of places. And about them four, in the original King James Version, becomes about them the four, or the four, I should say, in the new authorized version. Next, look at Job 34, 5 through 6. You see the poetic formatting. If you look carefully and compare it to the original King James Version, you see some punctuation changes. We have single quotation marks. We have the introduction of a pair of commas. And you no longer have the textual footnote that says wound is in Hebrew mine arrow. This well-loved psalm, Psalm 23, appears uh, to be unchanged. There may be minor punctuation changes there, but it agrees with the psalm as I memorized it. Here is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the chapter on charity, and as far as I can tell, it is unchanged, at least in the significant ways. There may be some punctuation changes that aren't obvious to me. One difference, though, I do notice, and uh, we mentioned this earlier, is that the words that the King James Version normally prints in italics are not italicized. So here in the cameo, you have the gift, the gift of in italics, and it is not italicized there. Generally, it's not going to cause you any difficulty, but I'll show you one instance where it might. So, the example I wanted to show is here in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 16, the verse that reads, For verily he took not on himself the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. And if you look at a modern translation, like the Legacy Standard Bible, you'll see a translation that's radically different from that, at least at it's your first impression. Um, Hebrews 2.16 in the Legacy Standard Bible, if I can get that in place. For assuredly he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the seed of Abraham. So that seems like a radically different translation. Well, it doesn't seem so radically different if you realize that some of the words there should be in italic font. So here is verse 16 in the cameo. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham, that him the nature of, and him again, 
are inserted to make sense of the passage. But if we read it without them, for verily he took not on angels, but he took on the seed of Abraham, and realize that the word behind it took on might mean give assistance to, take on as a responsibility, you get to the Legacy Standard Bible translation. Next, I wanted to show you what happens at the transition between the Old Testament and the Apocryphal books, and again between the Apocryphal books and the New Testament. So you have a page of paper here that has no lines on it, than normal Bible paper, and this gives you a sense for the opacity of the paper. You can read the De Deuterocanonical slash Apocryphal books through there and you come into them and you're in first Esdras. Now as the chart pointed out, this is first Esdras is not the first Esdras named first Esdras in the Dewey Reims Bible. That first Esdras is Ezra. This one is sort of like Ezra Nehemiah rewritten. Then you come to second Esdras, which is an entirely different book. It is not Nehemiah. Then you come to Tobit, and one of the questions you normally have about Tobit is, is this the longer Tobit or the shorter Tobit? This is the shorter Tobit. It agrees with G1 here in the New English Translation, the Septuagint, so it's much more like this than it is like this. If you're curious about the textual basis of the longer and the shorter editions, this paragraph, these paragraphs here, you should freeze the video and read them. And so, let's keep going. So we have Tobit, Judith. You can see some of the print variation just there, can't you? I mean, this is a fairly light page here. There's a light page, somewhat light, and then you come to this very dark page in Judith. So you see that commonly. It's not as annoying as some of the pages where there is sort of a cluttered background coming from the opposite side of the page because the text is not line matched. Still, I don't think that's too bad, and I've noticed it to be worse in artificial light than in natural light. Uh, Baruch, Susanna. So these additional fragments, this, uh, this goes in Daniel, as does the Song of the Three Holy Children. This is in chapter 3. Susanna and Bell are normally printed at the end of Daniel. Prayer of Manasseh, I believe, goes in Chronicles, where it's normally placed. And we have two books of Maccabees, not all four, as you would find in the Revised Standard Version, the New Oxford Annotated Bible. So let's look at the transition here. Second Maccabees, and then no note page. No blank page. We come to a title page for the New Testament, and our page numbers start again. This is page 2, page 3, and we were just at page 313, page 315, 317, and 19. When we come to Matthew, and we see the title, we see the chapter summary, single column text, and the notes down at the bottom of the page. In the introductory material, they mentioned that they included bracketed text, which uh, gave you the explanation for words as those explanations appeared in the original King James Version. So uh, Abel Mizraim, the explanation for that is given in brackets and square brackets right next to it. And I just wanted to show you from the original King James Version how that was done. So perhaps this will focus, perhaps we can get close enough. Far enough away, there it is. So that is the morning of the Egyptians, and this is the way it appeared in the original King James Version. So in summary, this is a moderately updated, revised version of the authorized translation, the King James translation of the Bible does have changes to the King James Version, so I'm sure King James onlyists uh, would oppose its use, but I think it's a, a quite a conservative revision. It does retain much of the majestic biblical language, 
It does make some changes that I regard as unnecessary. I've had people call me arrogant for saying that I regard them as unnecessary, but I'm just telling you my opinion. Um, if you don't like the word kine and prefer cows, that's fine. And this is maybe the very addition for you. The um, paper is very good. I like the paper. It's decently opaque. Um, there is a bit of an issue with the text not being line matched, but it's usable and it's not very distracting. I don't find it to be a great deal of an issue. We don't have much of a page a sheen problem. Um, the text block is sewn. Seems nice and sturdy. Um, single column format with poetic sections printed accordingly. I think this may just be the Bible that would be very useful to people that uh, have no hard preferences with regard to the words uh, pronouns for deity being capitalized, who don't mind the words of Christ in italic font, I should say oblique font in the New Testament, who don't need the words of Christ in red seems like a uh, decent enough addition to me. Oh, I just thought of one other thing I want to show you before we close the video. And that has to do with decisions you have to make if you decide to capitalize pronouns for deity. So here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, who is the one who holds back? Well, according to the New Authorized Version, the he is not a divine being. Only he who now holdeth back will hold him back until he is taken out of the way. So this he who is holding back is not the Holy Spirit, according to this translation. And yet many people think it is the Holy Spirit. You have the same kind of question here in Revelation chapter 14, where it's not clear whether this angel that's sitting on the cloud is supposed to be the Son of Man or just somebody who looks like him. But uh, this decision here, the decision this translation has made, is that it is not a divine being. And so with that observation, um, we will conclude this hopefully brief video about the Third Millennium Bible. Thanks very much for watching. Uh, remember to uh, like and share and tell all your friends. Thanks again.